welcome to NPTEL. Today, I will be teaching you advanced materials and processes. Myself, Jayanto Dash, and I am an associate professor at IIT Kharagpur, Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. The research work I have done so far is quite linked with this subject of metastable alloys, which are also advanced alloys and so on, metallic glasses, nanostructured alloys, high entropy alloys, low stacking fault energy alloys and non-equilibrium processing of these alloys for their superior mechanical and magnetic properties. So, before going to the main subject matter, we first need to recapitulate some of the basic ideas. We as a metallurgist develop most of the alloys as per the requirement of the desired properties. And here you can see the major engineering properties which are acoustic, chemical, electrical, uh, environmental, magnetic, mechanical, optical, radiological and thermal. These are the nine properties which are very much important for designing any materials. However, as a uh, metallurgy background, we mostly concentrate on this blue color written here, environmental means oxidation or any kind of degradation uh, in a aqueous medium and so on, magnetic properties and also the mechanical properties. However, these are all these um, nine properties uh, was uh, selected and the material has been selected based on these properties so far. But on 21st century, the trend of choosing material has a major and many more consideration for selection. So, materials for future, um, here the basic um, idea we keep all time the human welfare, because of the human welfare we need to develop materials by considering a more cleaner energy and a, a a more cleaner environment, so that the material what we produce, they should be recyclable as well as for taking into consideration of the national security and the next generation workforce. And this is a complete materials innovation infrastructure uh, is going on, which is also often called as materials genome initiative. In this particular aspect, whatever data we have collected as an engineer, as a researcher, we make them accessible to everybody and using many different computational tool considering their engineering properties or physical properties and also by interlinking different experimental tool, we like to develop materials and we also predict that by choosing some of the properties, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, target for getting a combination of many different engineering properties. So, this is uh, a very, very innovative approach so far going on, which is often called as a strategy for alloy development for 21st century. And here, there are uh, some important um, aspect we can see so the advanced material what do we mean by this advanced material the material that function using intricate and sophisticated principle this is somewhat a basic understanding on the advanced material but in this particular course, we will be not only discuss some new materials, but the understanding on the used material and their advanced understanding uh, uh, considering the research recent findings. So, these recent findings, uh, there are uh, updated literature and we will be trying to, to gain some knowledge out of that. As an example, I can talk about let us say nano engineered materials and these nano engineered materials, 
the nano engineered materials here, uh, the materials uh, we, we uh, often develop by design. What does it mean? It means by manipulating some of the atomic positions and configuration of the atoms. A configuration means a atom and surrounding there are many atoms. So, this particular configuration whether it is FCC packing, whether it is HCP packing and whether it is BCC packing or any other kind of um, packing, uh, we can develop newer structure in order to achieve some new functional properties using either top down approaches or bottom up approaches. Here top down approaches means that uh, we have a bulk material, we keep on processing these alloys in order to tune the, the structure in the atomic scale. Whereas, the bottom up approaches means that when we start with the atom or molecule and keep on depositing in a, in a substrate and, and developing uh, and, and making them to grow to make a bulk solid. So, this is called the, the, the bottom up approaches. However, there are many materials for let us say for semiconductor electronic materials, sensors and actuators, magnetic information storage and biomaterial, energy storage and so on. So, there are so many materials that are keep on developing day by day and by some dedicated researchers. So, these all are under the category of advanced material. One also important thing here is the smart materials what is really a smart material means that the material itself change its shape, position or let us say uh, mechanical uh, characteristic when uh, we uh, change some temperature parameter, some electric field is given to the material, some magnetic field may be given or let us say pressure. And so, if we change any of these parameters, then material uh, give a different response and these are often called as smart materials. So, as an example, I can tell you like a shape memory alloy, which is, uh, uh, is a very um, well known smart material and in this material, if we um, provide some mechanical stress and again, if we uh, give some temperature, the material can remember its shape. So, this is a very smart material. And, and so, uh, so on. So, there are so many uh, different objective of this uh, uh, particular course. Uh, however, we will be limited to the 30 hours of lecture and uh, let us say, um, um, if we first consider a very typical Ashby plot and we know that a materials, all the materials in our, in our world can be classified into three major categories. So, one is basically the, one is the, 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 the metals or alloys and uh, the other one is the ceramic because of the bonding nature we can classify three different category of materials and another one is the polymer. And uh, these three different class of materials, if we combine them, any two of them together, we, we call them as composites. However, we can also produce some composite by mixing any of this material with some air. So, like a, like a foam or let us say some, some, uh, some foam made out of polymer and air bubble. So, these are really very, very low density. You can see the density is almost like 0 0.1 milligram per meter cube. However, at the same time, the strength is also very less. On the other hand, the metals, metals are sitting almost at the higher density side, also at the higher strength level. So, if you have a very closer look to all these uh, different uh, region that is occupied by these three different class of materials we really cannot tune too much because metal has a range of density and range of a strength whereas ceramic has a strength range and density so the density is mostly controlled by the major alloying elements in case of a metal however the strength that can be increased almost 2 to 5 times if we can manipulate the structure and this is very, very important aspect of developing some next generation materials. So, this is a typical Ashby plot taken from Callister's book. So, um, however, at the same time, we can think about all the different uh, structures that are available. So, uh, any material that possesses basically any of these three structures uh, that is uh, shown here. So, 
uh, when we think about the periodicity of the atom, we call them as a crystalline structure. Here long range periodicity exists, whereas if the periodicity does not exist at all, we have some short range order we call. Let us say we can assume some of the atom and the nearby atom that basically gives you such kind of uh, peak actually. This is a x-ray diffraction pattern, three x-ray diffraction patterns are shown here. So, here you can see this is the atom and this is another atom, this is the next atom and so on. So, we have a long range periodicity which will give you such kind of uh, very very sharp diffraction peaks. So, here this is the scattering angle versus intensity and you can generate this plot under x-ray diffraction using Bragg's law. So, here if you have a very clear look, then we have basically some transcellular symmetry. So, there is a symmetry exist. So, atoms are basically sitting at a particular or fixed distance, whereas here the atoms there is no fixed position and they are randomly uh, distributed. So, these alloys are or, or materials are often called as amorphous material in case of alloys we call it as a glassy alloys. At the same time, here there is no symmetry exist and here we have both transcellular symmetry means periodicity of the atom as well as there is a rotational symmetry. But in case of a quasi crystalline structure, we only have rotational symmetry. Here you can see the rotational symmetry exist. If we take any of these three materials and then we go for some transmission electron microscopic studies and th there is a purpose called, called let us say uh, information we can collect from selected area electron diffraction pattern. So, this is a typical diffraction pattern from a crystalline alloys. Here you see both the periodicity exist. So, with a particular distance the, the reciprocal lattice point are, are are appeared in the selected area diffraction pattern. So, this is a transitional symmetry. At the same time, we can easily see that there is also a rotational symmetry exist. Okay. So, if we rotate this structure, then it is a symmetric one. Now, on the other hand, if we look at these kind of amorphous alloys, then we will get such kind of selected area diffraction, where we will get only amorphous halo, because there is no fixed periodicity of the atoms and the distance is varying. So, we will get this first halo which is somehow linked with this and this is the first halo to our link. Now, on the other case the quasi crystalline um, alloys here we can see only the rotational symmetry. So, here we can only see the rotational symmetry, but there is no transitional symmetry. So, this particular distance always follow the Fibonacci series. Okay. So, the distance is is linked with the Fibonacci series only. Now, once again uh, why we are talking about the structure because the structure and the properties are very much well linked and, and that is why we always a metallurgist always look for its structure in order to interlink the, the properties. Now, another uh, very simple as we plot if we look at here, uh, this is a, a elastic limit which basically means a yield strength versus Young's modulus plot. And here you see that the conventional engineering alloys like lead alloy or tin alloy or let us say the, the other titanium alloys and so on here the titanium alloy exists, uh, they are all are occupying some space in this in this map and and the higher the Young's modulus, the higher the elastic limit. Elastic limit means yield strength in mega Pascal. So, here steel is almost uh, dominating here, even though the theoretical limit is, is lying here. The theoretical uh, strength means basically uh, a, a crystal without having any dislocation or any defect, the material shows some strength and that is the theoretical strength that is extremely high. But that strength basically decreases a lot because of the presence of defect like dislocations, dislocations is one of the defect. However, if I take the same plot and put the glassy alloys like here some titanium based glassy alloys, some zirconium based glassy alloys and these are all the glassy alloys and here are the points. So, they are almost close to the theoretical limit. 
because these glassy alloys do not have any dislocation and they are showing much more higher strength level than the conventional steels. So, um, one can conclude that definitely for mechanical strength purpose uh, one can use these conventional uh, one can replace some of these conventional uh, steels with the with the advanced alloys. And therefore, we must look at what is the major driving force for, for let us say developing these kind of advanced alloys. Let us have a look at the crude steel production because we believe that the steel production uh, reflect the for a develop, um, developing countries uh, and, and, and its production is quite linked with the economy. So, here you see these uh, this is a last 20 years uh, uh, data I have taken from World Steel Association and this is the year from 1996 to 2016 and uh, we can we can see that uh, it continuously increases up to something like a 1600 uh, million ton. So, from 750 which was 20 years ago. So, almost 3 times or, or 2.5 times we have increased uh, as per the world uh, uh, context, the whole world context and this is the current scenario and th definitely the, the demand and the production they are quite linked because the more the demand, uh, the more the production requires. Uh, uh, in that aspect, we can also look at uh, some of the developed countries and developing countries and how much they really produce. So, as an example, uh, in Asia, um, in Asia, uh, we can we can see this uh, for the last 20 years from 200 it reaches up to 325 or so on. Uh, Asia means uh, including India and, and so on except China. In case of China, this value almost something like 100 million ton it reaches to almost like uh, 800 or so. So, this is almost like the 50 percent of the whole world uh, uh, crude steel production. So, that has increased with time a lot. So, these are the developing countries. On the other hand, if we look at the, the total crude steel production of the developed countries and, and uh, they basically show that in case of US, uh, uh, there is a uh, small decrease and also the crude steel production also has decreased uh, a bit. And this is because these advanced alloys are, are replacing even for some of the conventional engineering alloys. So, this is uh, just an example that we would like to show you. Um, now, uh, it is uh, often believed that uh, when we are talking about very high strength alloys, uh, because strength is one of the uh, important um, uh, properties, mechanical properties or let us say functional properties also. So, so, strength is important and we always believe that glassy alloys means probably they are like oxide glasses that, uh, that a material become very brittle because it has very high strength. But if we look at simple Griffith's theory and, and uh, fracture toughness consideration, then we may conclude that they may not be as we think. And here I show you a very uh, simple equation that is uh, the uh, fracture toughness uh, k which is linked with the strength and root over pi into a. A basically means that if we have a a, a, a crack inside a material and if we simply um, give some stress, then the presence of this crack which has a length that is A is a length and during application of some stress, this crack should, should grow and they become unstable when the value of K reaches to a critical value. So, this is the basic definition of the toughness. And uh, so, we can have a look that how uh, all the uh, very common engineering materials like metals and alloys, let us say like ceramic and let us say by comparing metallic glasses, how these values varies. So, let us have an example of the uh, simple yield strength. So, yield strength is, is somehow um, in a mega Pascal, if we, if we um, um, if we see the common uh, metals or alloys shows 400 mega Pascal strength. Now, in case of ceramic it is something like 3000 because they have a very high strength. 
3 gigapascal, whereas in case of a metallic glass or bulk metallic glass, it is 1800. So, we can see there is a huge variation. So, these values are very close to here ceramic. So, that is uh, uh, why we consider, but if we look at the fracture toughness values of a metal, it is uh, quite common something like 100 mega Pascal root meter. On the other hand, in case of ceramic, it is something like 10, 2 to 10. And in case of metallic glass due to metallic bonding, this glassy alloy shows something like 80. Now, if we consider y, uh, this value of y, the value of y is equal to 1, uh, this value if we consider, then we can only put sigma pi and a value and, and k value in order to get this, this a. So, um, here we can have a look. So, let us say the, the critical value of crank crack length. So, that is allowable for any kind of engineering design purpose. So, in case of a metal, it is 10 to the power minus 3 meter. Now, in case of a ceramic, it is 10 to the power minus 6. This means, it is in the micrometer range like a hair, human hair. So, th that has a thickness of micrometer. So, a hairline crack if we put on a ceramic oxide glass, and if we put some stress, the material will fail catastrophically without giving any kind of chance to repair it. In case of a metal, it is in the range of basically centimeter. We can see this is actually 10 to the power minus 3. Whereas, if we take this same for in case of a glassy alloys, it is 10 to the power minus 3. The same order here. Uh, or let us say one order small order a little bit less. So, this is something like 1 centimeter. Uh, in case of a ceramic, it is 1 micrometer. In case of a metallic glass, we have a 1 millimeter length scale. So, a 1 millimeter crack, even there is a presence of such length scale crack in a glass, the material will sustain the load. So, that basically says that the glassy alloys are close to the metallic engineered in alloys and not like ceramic oxide glasses. And uh, if we uh, look at uh, some of the again some, some SV plots uh, that will uh, give us some, some more information. So, here I, I show you um, uh, a plot in the left hand side which is also a SV plot uh, taken from a recent literature. Uh, please have a look here in the y axis in the y axis uh, the the values of fracture toughness are plotted and in the in the x axis we have yield strength so um, uh, different different or three categories of materials like uh, like uh, pol engineering polymers engineering ceramics and engineering metals, they are occupying very different spaces. So, one can have a look that the nylons or let us say high density polyethylene or low density polyethylene definitely show some lower values of toughness and also lower strength, but important is the steel is occupying at the at the at the topmost place here like nickel alloys, titanium alloys, copper alloys, aluminum alloys, tungsten alloys and so on. Whereas, metallic glasses are occupying the space almost very close to the conventional titanium, nickel or steels. So, it gives us that there is a high accessibility of metallic glasses or larger process zone size. So, we can use these material for engineering purpose and that makes them uh, that a very high strength as well as very high toughness. Uh, one can see here, this is also a, a recent literature from Dimatriu. Uh, we can see a shear sliding event a, in front of a large plastic zone uh, around a crack tip. So, uh, the length scale is almost like a millimeter scale. So, the process zone size of, of let us say uh, such an example of a palladium based glass is very, very high. So, uh, it basically says us that a, a large uh, uh, number of these advanced high strength alloys could be used, uh, uh, which is also under use and also will be used in future.
So, um, people have also explored lot of different ex, uh, application areas so far. Um, one can see these are the golf club because of the high elastic strain limit one can one can use them uh, for uh, for golf clubs because they have a very high resilience they can uh, store a high, very high amount of elastic energy so one can one can use them also for very uh, high uh, aesthetic nature and and surface finish one can use as a case uh, uh, like also some of the usb stick uh, cases and so on another important plot is shown here one can see here that the glassy alloys have a very high strength at the same time it has a very high elastic strain limit. So, almost like 2 percent which is far superior than the conventional steel or titanium alloys or polymers or silicate glasses. So, this high elastic strain limit one can exploit this material for sensors. This is a simple pressure sensor like a diaphragm is used and often used for, for different purposes also in this uh, tennis racket and so on. On the other side of the mechanical properties, this material shows uh, a very good soft magnetic properties. A soft magnetic properties means that almost zero core losses. So, we can take the advantage of the smaller dimension. This is a typical fingertip and this is the dimension of such a small motor that is used for a micro motor uh, developing some micro motor. So, not only the mechanical properties, but also many other functional properties like magnetic properties and so on. These material, these glassy alloys could be could be used. Uh, also, uh, one can see some some uh, a bigger image of, of such uh, uh, small motor and here uh, I show you um, a, a micro gear that is used for MEMS that gives you a very, very smaller dimension, but the most important thing that whenever there is a crystal structure, then a anisotropy exists in terms of properties. But since the atoms are organized randomly in this uh, particular uh, gear, so we can get all uh, direction the same hardness values. So, hardness and mechanical properties, strength and so on. Also, the processability is also very, very high because uh, we can go to the supercooled liquid region close to the glass transition temperature and we can extend such alloys and give us some uh, super plastic like behavior. We can also make a litho and produce a very good uh, dimensional tolerance and uh, very, uh, very low wear rate for making any kind of litho or imprint technologies. And also very large scale these kind of hollow pipes can be also produced by these glassy alloys, also large size gears can be produced. And so, it, it basically says that these alloys may replace some of these conventionally used alloys uh, and there is a large prospect of these advanced alloys or metastable alloys. Thank you.